Welcome to this episode of the Australian Naval History podcast series, where we examine an event in or an aspect of the Royal Australian Navy's history. The Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales is supported in this series by the Royal Australian Navy Sea Power Centre, the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society of Australia, and the Submarine Institute of Australia. Hello, I'm Commander Alastair Cooper, Deputy Director of the Sea Power Centre Australia. This is the first of two episodes devoted to one of the most heroic groups ever to serve Australia in war. They were the Coast Watchers of World War II. These men and one woman reported on shipping, air movements, and saved stranded servicemen in the islands to the north of Australia during World War II. With the Japanese onslaught in 1941 and 42, they stayed behind enemy lines to continue their vital work. They faced great danger with courage and resolution. The Coast Watchers organisation played a pivotal role in the Solomons campaign and led the United States Admiral William Bull Halsey to say, the Coast Watchers saved Guadalcanal and Guadalcanal saved the Pacific. To discuss the truly compelling story of the Coast Watchers, I am joined by Mr. Jim Burrows. And Jim, we're honoured to have you with us today um, as one of the last surviving, or as the last surviving radio operator who is part of the Coast Watcher organisation. Thank you for joining us. Vice Admiral Peter Jones, retired, who wrote the book Australia's Argonauts, the remarkable story of the first class to enter the Royal Australian Naval College. And among that class were Eric Felt, who ran the Coast Watcher <coughs> Network, <coughs> Rupert Long, the Director of Naval Intelligence, and Hugh McKenzie, a Coast Watcher. We're also joined by Dr. Betty Lee, a great niece of Eric Felt, who is writing a biography of her famous relation. Betty, thank you for joining us. And finally, Mr. John Perryman, the Royal Australian Navy's Director of Naval History and Strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. John, if I can turn to you first, the Coast Watcher organisation predated World War II. Can you describe it for me, please? Absolutely. In two words, it's, it's fascinating and it's fortuitous. It's fortuitous that in 1919, the then District Naval Officer of Western Australia, Captain Clare, put forward a proposal um, concerning civilian volunteers living in coastal areas and having them report on uh, suspicious or unusual happenings around the coast of Australia in wartime. He's, he understood that Australia was a vast continent uh, and that monitoring our sea approaches was important. So he put this proposal forward uh, to Navy office, which at that time was in Melbourne. Now, there it was received very, very uh, well, in fact, so well that they decided they would implement this, but with a couple of conditions. And one of those was this, that not just was Australia in need of a coastal uh, observation group, but also the islands that form that bulwark between us and the northern extreme. So uh, Papua, New Guinea, uh, the Solomon Islands, that was to be included. Now, much of that work uh, fell to a very, very accomplished civil servant uh, whose name was Walter Brooksbank. Brooksbank had been uh, a soldier in World War I. He'd been decorated. And after the war, he'd established himself as somebody who was really unequaled in, in naval intelligence. So he was part of this. But as an administrator and a bureaucrat, he knew what was required to implement this scheme. So he really was the, the person behind the scenes in Navy office getting this set up uh, and that's what it led to. So born in 1919, uh, came to fruition sometime later, but certainly well in place for World War II. Thanks, John. Peter, um, in a previous season, we spoke about Rupert Long with reference to his code breaking, but what was his role in the Coast Watchers? So Rupert Long, as you mentioned, was the Director of Naval Intelligence. Um, and before World War II, he provided the vision and drive for a reinvigorated Coast Watcher network. He saw it as one of the key elements of naval intelligence. Other areas that he um, helped establish was a code-breaking uh, um, small capacity that we've talked about in a previous episode, um, and also a local intelligence network. And he reinvigorated <coughs> that around the ports for people to report on suspicious um, activity. But it was Rupert Long who saw 
uh, Australia needed to expand the Coast Watcher network beyond the Australian shores, particularly in New Guinea, as John has mentioned, but also in the Solomons. Um, he identified his old friend Eric Felt as a man to realise that vision. And it was Rupert Long who obtained approvals for the reinvigorated and expanded Coast Watcher organisation. He got the resources and he supported Eric Felt all along the way. Betty, uh, as Peter said, Rupert Long turned to his classmate Eric Felt because of his experience in the islands. Can you tell us a little bit more about it, Eric Felt? Okay, well, yes, there, there's so much I could say about Eric Felt, um, but uh, the time limit sat. Um, I, I recognise I'm very biased, <laughs> but it seems to me that it was some sort of miracle for Australia that Rupert Long and Eric Felt and Hugh McKenzie existed. Um, Eric, in particular, was seemed to be tailor-made for his jobs, um, the first in setting up the Coast Watchers and the second in being their leader. Uh, he was a man of many talents. His leadership abilities were recognised in the Naval College. Uh, he was regularly a cadet captain and eventually a chief cadet captain. He was also captain of the rugby team. Uh, he left the Navy in 1922, and in 1923, he found work in the administrative service of the Australian mandated territory of New Guinea. Becoming a patrol officer, he traveled all over the territory, often into the jungle and at times into headhunter regions. He was capable and practical, and he rose to become a district officer at a younger age than usual. He restored one district, which was in disarray to a really well-functioning one. He became warden of Wow Goldfield. So in his 16 years in New Guinea, he learnt the lay of the land and he gained the respect of the expatriate Australians and Indigenous people. In April 1939, he re-enlisted on the Navy's emergency list and when war broke out, as Peter said, Rupert Long saw him as being the ideal leader for the Coast Watch project he'd been planning. Uh, Eric's title was Staff Officer Intelligence at Port Moresby and he went all around the Territory recruiting civilians to be Coast Watchers, mainly people who had tele-radios. The question arose about what should be done if there was an invasion. The Coast Watchers who were Naval Officers could be ordered to stay, taking to the bush if necessary, but no such orders could be given to the civilians. The Navy told them to bury their, their tele-radios and escape. Um, Eric was a forward-thinking individual and privately discussed the question with many of them. Uh, and he told them that their services might be of great value if they remained. But the decision was entirely up to them. And the fact that many of them did, I think, was in part out of their loyalty to, to Eric. Um, when the war came, his responsibility, of course, increased dramatically. Um, and he wanted the civilians to be given some military standing. Um, to provide them with some income and, and a pension for their widows should the worst outcome occur. And eventually they became members of the Royal Australian Navy Reserve. And I just want to say that 1942 was a year when Australia was in the gravest danger of losing what was vital to its existence. And this importance was very obvious to Eric. And he certainly devoted his heart and soul to the fight in the Pacific and his homeland, for the Pacific and his homeland. Wow, he certainly seems like an impressive, <laughs> an impressive relative. Um, you raised some really interesting um, uh, um, things. Um, first of all, John, um, it seems that one of Eric Felt's early tasks was to develop plans for the Coast Watching Network and then find people. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how he went about that. Very happy to do that. Felt is this enigmatic character who, you know, has this passion for the islands. He's there, he understands the terrain, he understands the people, he understands the relationship with those, those men and the woman who would uh, be best suited to becoming Coast Watchers. So, you know, on the eve of Japanese, uh, the Japanese entry into the war, he has set out by ship, by boat, on foot and bicycle to visit those people that he felt were best suited 
to, to do this. And it wasn't a matter of just plonking somebody in there. These people had to understand the terrain in which they were working and the islanders that they were working with. And just on the islanders, they play a, a significant part in this story. Mm. But um, on the eve of the Japanese coming into the war, there were in fact 64 uh, uh, teleradio equipped sites set up around that area. Um, and that wove a network over more than half a million square miles. So you can really see that he, his contribution was not insignificant. Thank you. And Peter Jones, um, we've mentioned that the Coast Watchers came from the three services. Can you explain how that came about and what the purpose was? Yes, so as um, uh, Betty's alluded to, there, there was an appreciation by Rupert Long and Eric Felt that it was highly desirable for the, for the Coast Watchers, wherever possible, to be part of the military. Um, and from a practical perspective, um, it led the Coast Watchers to come from the three services. And the reason was a number of the, uh, the, the Coast Watchers had been in, in the Army in World War I, as an example. And so it was a lot easier for them to be, uh, if you like, put back into the Army in the uh, um, in a reserve capacity, um, and so that was done. Um, and that was organised by Rupert Long in Melbourne, um, in the, and he could use his contacts in the army to, to affect that. Um, and also there was a, a rule at the time, if you were going to be a, a, an officer in the Naval Reserve, you had to have some mariner skills. So if you didn't have mariner skills, um, it was easier, once again, to be either in the Army or the Air Force. And so Rupert was very practical about this and he used his contacts to get people into uniform. And as Betty said, the concern was really twofold. One was if they were captured and they didn't want to be um, uh, treated as a civilian spy. Um, and the other piece was uh, they knew that this was hazardous work and so that what they didn't want is uh, for if someone was killed, that their widow and family didn't have a pension. So that was sort of the driver. And so that they would um, uh, organise for people to be enlisted, even though they were still in, in the, their, their locality, and they would parachute the uniform and so on uh, for them to wear. Thank you. Jim Burrows, uh, in 1942, you were an 18 year old member of the Australian Army. How did you come to join the Coast Watchers? Well, so if you don't mind, uh, there's been a lot of talk from uh, the previous ones about the Coast Watchers. Mm. Um, but I'd just like to establish two things. First of all, I was very pleased to be invited here because, as I mentioned to Peter before, this is a Navy operation. Most people think of Coast Watchers as Army. They were Navy, thanks to Eric felt. Secondly, um, uh, the basic components of a, of a coast watching family were threefold. They needed these expatriates with the background that Peter and, and mentioned and you mentioned John recruited. Mm -hmm. They need a radio operator, mm -hmm. of which I was one, yep. and they need the natives. Three components. Later on, they got military people to support, but those three components, without any one of them, without me, for example, there would not have been Coast Watchers. So I want to make that clear. As for joining the Army, my two brothers were, uh, I was 16 when the war started, my two brothers were already in the services because uh, um, my older brother was a, uh, a Royal Australian Engineer mm -hmm. Militia, disparagingly called Choco as they were, which mm. was very rude because they were in the army. Um, and my twin brother, Tom, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, a cadet, a Royal Australian cadet, was automatically called up. So um, um, on the day of induction, we turned up at uh, Albert Park Barracks and there's a big crowd milling around and some sergeant major said, uh, came up and said, hands up those who are a school teacher or have uh, worked in an office. Because I'd worked in an office as office boy for a year, getting 18 trumps a week, um, I put my hand up. 
in that way, they must have thought we were a bit more intelligent than those. Your inventory. So, unbeknownst to me at that time, I became to be came later a case watcher. First of all, uh, we did six weeks training, training uh, learning Morse code at the RMIT. Mm -hmm. Then I was transferred to land headquarters where we had the only uh, radio uh, contact with Moresby when the Japs were 26 down there. Eight hour shifts round the, round the clock, pretty uh, tough work. And, um, and then, uh, uh, Oh, that's right. I'm talking about. Talking no, no, about. It's, it's all good. So, so you um, land headquarters, and then how yeah, did you get involved sorry, with the yeah. coast watchers? Um, then, as the uh, AWAS came along and uh, released us, we moved up north to to Queensland. AWAS being Australian, uh, Australian Women's, Women's Army, Army Services. Services. Yeah, um, where we continued on, but when we were there, they called for six volunteers of radio operators. Uh, for to join a uh, a, um, a, a very dangerous mission up north. Um, there's an old adage: you never volunteer for anything in the army. But I put, put my, couldn't put my hand up quick enough because my two brothers were up there, mm -hmm. and a bit big high adventure. I was only 18 or something, so um, so we w went up there and found uh, that we'd been seconded, and no one in in the public knew at the time and probably don't know now, uh, I was, uh, became part of the US 7th Fleet uh, with the Americans. They had an amphibious landing force whereby uh, we then, with a leader, uh, leader they'd co-opted from the ex expatriates and a radio operator, where we uh, moved around very uh, various islands um, to see the, the Japanese presence, including Gas Marta, which was taken over by the Japs, and um, and Woodlark Island and what have you. So uh, after about nine months, they disbanded, and three of the six wanted to go back to Australia. Uh, I said, no way, and uh, we then transferred to the Coast Watchers. That's how we became a Coast Watcher. After two and a half years early, the rest of the four years in the Army was Coast Watcher. Thank you. That's fantastic. Betty, could I get you to talk a little bit now about where Eric Felt coordinated the Coast Watch network from. Yes, um, Eric first coordinated <coughs> the Coast Watchers at Port Moresby from September 1939, uh, as I said before, as Staff Officer Intelligence with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Um, and during the war, cooperation between the Navy, Army and Air Force is essential. So an area combined headquarters, ACH, was formed in Melbourne and an ACH followed in Port Moresby. While in Port Moresby, Eric made arrangements to continue coast watching if the Japanese invaded. He had three months supply for himself and 10 native soldiers hidden away in an inland plantation and a tele-radio was on standby for instant transporting. Uh, if Port Moresby was gonna fall, Eric had every intention to keep watch from the hills. Um, however, a decision was made to move ACH from Port Moresby to Townsville, and this happened in May 1941. With the move, Eric's title changed to Supervising Intelligence Officer, and that was the, head, the name for the head of the Coast Watchers for the rest of the time in the war. Um, in Townsville, his office was a back room with one civil <coughs> assistant called Paddy Murray. A combined operational intelligence centre was formed at ACH in Townsville and it had officers from the three services working together to evaluate and collate intelligence. In March 1942, General MacArthur arrived in Australia and in early June, the Allied Intelligence Bureau, AIB, was formed. Shortly after this, Eric became acting commander. Um, by the end of October 1942, it was considered Port Moresby was free from the threat of invasion by the Japanese, and the Coast Watchers and Eric moved there on the 1st of November. General Headquarters also moved to Port Moresby, and Eric met General MacArthur for the first time. Um, the General expressed his appreciation for the work the Coast Watchers were doing to Eric. Um, later, under the leadership of Commander McManus, the Coast Watchers headquarters moved to Brisbane at the end of 1943.
Thank you. We've mentioned tele radios a number of times now. And Jim, as a radio operator, I'm figuring you might be able to tell us a little bit about them. Yes, Alistair. Um, initially, um, uh, we uh, worked on uh, an AWA, which is privately owned wireless. wireless association, SIBIS, okay. um, equipment called a 3A and a 3B. They were fairly massive, uh, a foot by a foot by two feet or what have you, three units. Um, they did require uh, power, mm -hmm. obviously, and uh, therefore they came along with a, a good old Bigson Stratton engine, a generator, a generator, and car batteries. This collection took about 12 to 16 natives to carry it through the bush, and they were limited because of the weight and the inconvenience to about five, five miles a, a, a day. Um, I use these in my forward uh, uh, operations at um, Millen Bay briefly, then NADZAB, which was the main AUS uh, air, air base. Uh, then I moved up to Medang, where the uh, Aussies had just landed, and I use these. Um, uh, later on, when I crossed over to uh, to New Britain uh, and went up to, up into the jungle uh, uh, in Japanese occupied territory, um, we'd reverted to a, a little, uh, uh, would you believe, made by uh, Radio Corporation in Melbourne, an ATR4A. It was battery driven, and it was just a case of about one foot by two feet in a steel case and um, just sitting on uh, a group of ba batteries. That could be carried with one or even two natives. That's the difference there. So the tele radio was initially used in forward bases uh, were replaced by this smaller unit. Okay, so, so the, so the tele radio is different to an ATR. 4A. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. All right, but that so the the tele radio was, was the was the initially that large. Correct. The tele radio was involved all that battery stuff yep. and generator etc., which was eliminated with a little ATR 4A. Wow. And that had a radio uh, of 500 mile, miles. Yeah. Range of about five. Mm. As a follow up, I understand that you would have had to have used some codes, um, and particularly the Playfair code. Can you describe it? Yeah, originally um, we used a Playfair system, which was a low-grade uh, code. Uh, it involved uh, having a, a book and looking at uh, page numbers and heaven knows what I've forgotten now. And um, uh, it was actually modified by Eric, and in fact it was called initially Playfair Felt Method. Um, later on, uh, with advancement uh, in technology, it was reverted, uh, the code was reverted to ball code, the U double L okay. code. And that was a, uh, a more sophisticated uh, method of, co of coding. I, um, I often wonder, well, so I don't know if I'm on the top M now, how uh, uh, we must have had a. Um, uh, a pencil and paper and we would have had a table or anything like that so how we did I don't know but the code was involving uh, sending uh, uh, a series of five letters like could be X, Y, Z, 2, 8 or something like that uh, a series of, of those so uh, they, they, were the, uh, uh, they were the codes and they were the, how we transmitted one other important thing is we had uh, uh, a little crystal called an X crystal, and that was uh, dedicated just to the coast watches which we used. Okay, and what did the X crystal do? Don't ask me. <laughs> All right, I won't. <laughs> Peter Jones, um, Eric Felt developed. It a worked anyway. <laughs> a key thing. <laughs> Peter, um, Eric developed the hub and spoke ne network for the coast watches. What was this? Yes, um, and probably just follow, go back to that, the X crystal. So the X crystal provided the discrete frequency that was, that was distinct for coast watches. Right. Um, 
But in answer to your question, the hub and spoke. So as Jim's alluded to, the the uh, the radios had a had a were well, range limited, mm-hmm. um, and so what Eric conceived was just like the uh, a bicycle wheel, that if you could imagine each spoke at the end of each spoke is one of those sixty four Coast Watcher locations, the hub is going to be an, uh, within range of a bunch of these uh, stations and, or uh, reporting sites. And the hubs that Eric um, selected was Port Moresby, Rabaul, Tulagi, and Thursday Island. So, um, so Coast Watchers would report to their respective um, hub, and then from the hub, they would then uh, s- uh, transmit signals back to uh, where Eric was located. And some of those signals, of course, depending on their import, would also then be relayed back to Melbourne or to, uh, to wherever was, uh, that, that information was needed. Thank you. Betty, the Coast Watch organisation was known as Ferdinand. Yeah. Its name was chosen by Eric Fell. Why? Okay. (laughs) All right. When the Allied Intelligence Bureau was formed in June 1942, a difference needed to be made between his two roles, his naval intelligence duties and his command of the Coast Watchers. So Eric thought keeping the name Coast Watchers was too revealing. Um, For security, he wanted a name that would not give away the nature of their activities to, to a casual listener. So he decided Ferdinand would be a suitable name. He would have seen Ferdinand the Bull at the movies because Disney had made an animated short movie in 1938, or cartoon as we used to call them anyway. And um, it was based on a children's book called The Story of Ferdinand by Munro Leaf. And the hero, Ferdinand, was a bull who preferred to sit under a tree and smell the flowers rather than fight. That's right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the That's name... That's what we did. <laughs> you did, yes. <laughs> the name was meant to remind the Coast Watchers that they were to sit in conspicuously gathering information and not their duty to fight or draw attention to themselves. However, if they were stung like Ferdinand, they could fight. That's superb. Thank you. Peter, Rabaul was potentially uh, an important hub Um, as it had a strategically important harbour that would attract the interest of the Japanese. Who was in charge of that particular hub for for the Coast Watchers? So um, it was uh, Lieutenant Commander Hugh McKenzie. Um, So Hugh, um, as we indicated, was also a a classmate of Rupert Long and Eric Filt. Um, Like Eric, uh, Hugh had... um, left the Navy soon after World War II. He'd gone to, to New Guinea. Uh, he'd been a planter. Uh, he'd even um, um, had a, a lugger and transporting indentured labour. What's a lugger? Um, a, a, a lugger is uh, a small coastal trading vessel, ah. sometimes used for pearling, but in, the, in this case, uh, used for transporting um, people around the uh, New Guinea coast. Um, so Hugh, like Eric, was very well experienced in, in the area, um, and, but in his role, he was there um, to be two things. One, a liaison in the headquarters of Sparrow Force. So Sparrow Force was about 1,600 troops under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Scanlon. Um, so they were the garrison for Rabaul. Um, nearby was uh, the Air Force contingent um, at a nearby airfield where there were 10 Wirraway fighters and four Hudson bombers. So um, Hugh's role was to be the, that naval liaison to Lieutenant Colonel Scanlon, but to be in charge of that hub for the Coast Watchers who were operating um, on New Britain, but also in the islands to the north, the approaches to, to Rabaul. Thank you. John Perryman. Um, We can't hope to cover all the exploits of the Coast Watchers in this episode, but we should perhaps start with the Japanese invasion invasion of Rabaul. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Of course, and this is where the the Coast Watching Network really begins to, um, you know, pay dividends because uh, the movements were known. Uh, They knew that this force was heading to Rabaul, so sufficient warning was given 
to begin evacuating and prepare their defences. I think that's important to note. Yeah. So the Japanese first turned their attention to Rabaul uh, on about the 20th of January um, with airstrikes. They landed in ensuing night operations, 22nd, 23rd of January, and pretty well by the end of the month, in what the Japanese were later described as almost a, a, a bloodless uh, action, they had Rabaul. So what that meant then was for those troops that have, have been mentioned previously, they've had to withdraw, the Coast Watchers too. Mm -hmm. So the Coast Watchers have, have followed the instructions that they've had an agreement with, with, with FELT, to either uh, move inland to other observation uh, points where they can continue to provide important uh, intelligence or destroy their sets and make with their escape. Now, this is where uh, the troops are now scattered. Um, and they are confronted for the first time. They're not in a garrison, they don't have the support, they have diminishing rations, little ammunition, and they're confronted with um, the land itself. So the land now has become, you know, almost as, as big an enemy as the Japanese. Now, Felt then contacts one of his coast watchers, a bloke by the name of uh, District Officer McCarthy, a red-headed Irishman based at Tallassee. Uh, and it's a funny thing about redheads because they, they pop up throughout this story uh, continuously. But McCarthy, so he is asked to provide the intelligence, how far have they probed? We need to know this now. And he, with some of his colleagues, undertakes a 200 mile trek to find that intelligence out and report back, which he does. But in the course of that, right, he comes across these broken up forces which have had been uh, needed to, to, to flee into the jungle. So he starts get, getting them together. To cut a long story short, he then shepherds, cajoles, and gets these people up to the mid uh, northern coast of, of Rabaul and begins to affect their evacuation. And this is where the second redhead in our story comes into, uh, into the equation. Uh, a big fleshy young man with red hair by the name of, you guessed it, Blue, Blue Harris. Harris. <laughs> there you are. So that's that's Jim commenting. So Jim, this guy appears in this collection of vessels and launches, which is coined the Harris Navy. Now, what he does is working with McCarthy, he affects the evacuation of these troops, not south, but north to the island of Witu. And there they've got a ship called the Lakatoi, which has been taken over, and they embark in that and over the next couple of months, they dodge the Japanese, skirt around the islands, and they actually make it back to Cairns with uh, something like just over 200 people on board, including two women. And that was all because of the Coast Watchers. Extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Betty, Eric felt also uh, tried to rescue some of the Coast Watchers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about his efforts? Yeah, yes, indeed. I just want to say that when the Lakatoi did eventually arrive in Cairns with Keith McCarthy and the rescued soldiers, they were met by a pilot boat and on board the pilot boat were the pilot, a doctor and Eric. Mm. I could also add too, they got a very bad reception. People accused them of deserting their bloody post. Did they? Yeah. Oh, no. Very bad. Terrible. The poor buggers was barely alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully yeah. we know better now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> anyway, the other rescues um, did not go so well. Con Page on Tabor, who had sort of sent the messages about Rubal and the, the um, flights coming in, he was quite an enthusiastic coast watcher. Um, but with the fall of Rubal, the danger of being captured by the Japanese outweighed the, any advantage of the information he could send. So Eric sent him a message and thanked him for his wonderful work and said to bury his teleradio and escape. Con Page ignored the message. He stayed. However, after several months um, had passed, he agreed to be rescued, but attempts unfortunately failed. Um, Eric arranged a final attempt in June by Catalina, but there was no sign of Con. And on New Ireland were Bill Kyle and Greg Benham. Bill Kyle was Eric's best friend. Uh, one month after the fall of Rabol, Eric arranged for the very first drop of supplies to Coast Watchers. Uh, he later arranged for a submarine to rescue them. But when it arrived back in Townsville, he was dismayed to find that Bill and Greg were not on board. The submarine had kept the rendezvous for two nights, at the end of May, but the two coasters hadn't appeared. 
He, not to be daunted, he arranged for another submarine to be sent with Coast Watcher Cecil Mason, who had volunteered to go ashore. And it was hoped also to rescue Woodruff on Anir Island. However, it was, this wasn't to be either. And it was later found that Mason and the other three men had been captured and killed by the Japanese. Peter, um, we've mentioned the uh, Sparrow Force in Rabaul, um, but the Coast Watchers also had a role in assisting Lark Force. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so, um, so just following on from John's uh, um, description of the activities of Keith McCarthy. So uh, Hugh McKenzie and his small team, as instructed uh, after the invasion, they, they had buried their tele radios. They'd moved south down the, down the east coast of New Britain, helping uh, members of Lark Force um, as they went. And, and as John indicated, um, uh, these soldiers weren't trained in, in jungle craft and, and survival. Um, so it helped those. Um, Hugh actually came to Toll Plantation and found that 150 of Lark Force had been massacred by the Japanese. Um, but he, he uh, continued south um, and came upon a, a, a group that was in another plantation. And they, he stayed with them um, and eventually they were rescued by a boat as well. Cool, thank you. Jim Burrows, um, I understand Rabaul has a special significance for you and your family. Can you tell us about that? Yes, unfortunately, Alistair, um, my elder brother who was in the uh, Royal Australian Engineers when the war broke out that's in Europe, but had they'd been called up, uh, and uh, I think I mentioned before, they were uh, badly called uh, chocos and what have you, but they were um, forwarded up to, to rebel in February, that's 10 months before Pearl Harbor. And um, uh, anyway, uh, they were captured uh, when the Japanese landed on the 22nd of January. Incidentally, uh, uh, in one of his letters from the Japs saying that the Japs dropped a lot of letters from all the prisoners saying, we are prisoners of the Japanese and being well looked after, which was a load of crap. And um, uh, in, in one of Robert's letters back, which is allowed to say one other question, get Jim out of the army, but it's too late because uh, I was there a week in the army before Pearl Harbor. So uh, he was on the, uh, uh, after five years of slavery, five months of slavery, uh, uh, working for the, uh, well, Japs in tunnels and unloading the ship. He was uh, on the Montevideo Maru prison ship that was um, uh, sent to, uh, been uh, transported to um, Highland, Highland Island uh, working, but, um, uh, as everyone knows, I think uh, it was sunk by the uh, an American submarine because of an unmarked prison ship, and a thousand and fifty-three mem uh, members went down, drowned, including my brother. Um, I'll try and make it quick. My uh, other, uh, my other brother, who was my twin brother, uh, he'd been in the Air Force uh, cadets. He was had been called up, obviously, when the war started. He, became, he would have been intended to go to Canada and England uh, to fight over in Britain, but the Japs intervened. Uh, they were diverted to uh, uh, Good Enough Island, just north of Biltmore Bay, in a hundred squadron of Beaufort bombers, which were known as uh, flying coffins. Uh, on his first flight out, uh, never heard of again. So uh, I lost two brothers at Rebel. Bit tough on the old mum uh, who uh, was one of the women of the West from uh, her early history and uh, one of the lines in that poem they wrote about the women of the West and they, you give your sons whatever and she lost her too. Our family, uh, which was a family of seven, uh, during the war my father died, my sister died in childbirth so we became a family of three instead of uh, um, seven. But uh, that's why uh, it has special significance of rebel. Uh, the destiny of the three of us, three brothers, but I'm the only one that came home. Well, we're grateful for all of you, particularly for you being here. Yes, indeed. Peter Jones, um, the Japanese invasion of rebel was, if you like, the 
uh, the Coast Watch's first contact. Um, what did that experience tell us of Rupert Long and Eric Felt? Yes, yeah, so to, probably to answer that question, we just need to fill in a, a bit of some of that story. Um, so Betty's talked about the fate of some of those uh, isolated Coast Watches on the islands. Um, but as uh, the Japanese uh, bombed Rabaul before the invasion, um, th and uh, as the invasion fleet came down, there were Coast Watches in the islands to the north of Rabaul. Um, and they were reporting the, um, the Japanese movements. But then as the, the Japanese actually came and uh, landed on those islands, they then had to run the gauntlet of the Japanese. And some of those islands were quite small. So Ken Chambers on Emerau Island, he, he managed to escape by boat. Cecil Jarvis on Nissan Island was never heard of again. And Murray Edwards in Kaviang, he was killed by the Japanese. The point being though is that um, Eric and Rupert were just getting fragments of information about the fate of some of their coast watches. And, and some of those uh, fates, uh, which was, you know, brutal ends in, in, um, in lone deaths, um, they weren't known to the end of the war. But what they did start to realise was that, uh, as Betty had said, was unless the coast watcher was at... Um, was actually able to provide useful intelligence and it was worth the risk of them being on a small island and could have some reasonable um, prospect of being undetected, they had to be removed. And so they, they realised they had to change their method and also they were starting to see the brutality of the Japanese against locals, expatriates and in particular the Coast Watchers who they just hunted and they also had dogs looking for for them in, in the bush. Mm. Okay. So, so do you mind if I just uh, add, if I don't mind, Peter? Um, certainly. Um, the Coast Watchers through McCarthy, that had been mentioned by John, um, repatriated 200, of, about 400 blokes went bush. Uh, they're not the ones, obviously, went on the Montevideo move. Um, and then Lakatoi, they saved about a couple of hundred that Pete took them there. To, but on the south side of the island, I think it was, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name there, but uh, also the Coast Watchers got the Lorabada, and that went down to, to New Guinea and came out at Moresby. So the Coast Watchers saved 400 of those poor buggers, pardon my language, um, that had uh, struggled so badly yeah, yeah. through the bush. Yeah. No food, no equipment, no medical assistance. Mm. So the Coast Watchers were well and truly, yes, yes. The including army Blue Harris, mm. which I'll mention later. Mm. The army didn't rescue them. The army didn't send anybody to no, rescue them. No, no, it was, mm. uh, it was terrible. It was pretty uh, miserable. The Australian army sent a message. There should be no reinforcements, no rescue, no, no, Dun no Dunkirks. Mm. They could have had a Dunkirk. Um, well, Blue Harris uh, there was, was a sort fight to the finish. There was a fight to the finish, and the finish was that afternoon when Scanlon said every man for himself. So I think it's uh, desperate times that it's almost hard yeah. for us to imagine now. Oh. Yeah. A final question, if I may, for this, um, this episode. John Perryman, um, the Coast Watchers played a little-known part in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Could you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. One only has to look at the, uh, the map to the north of Australia to see just how strategically positioned some of these coast watches were. The Solomon Sea is uh, butts up to the north of the, of the Coral Sea and dotted throughout that, all of those islands there you have coast watches. So, you know, before the, Coral, the Battle of the Coral Sea um, happened, uh, they could see Japanese forces gathering. They got a sense that there was going to be this, this push to capture Port Moresby by coming around through the Jomar Passage to the south. So they had advance warning that this was happening and that's why um, the Australians with the Americans were able to go and block that, that uh, attempt, if you like, forcing the Japanese back. But what I would also say is that some of the information that was being uh, reported by the Coast Watchers wasn't just about movements of enemy troops. And this sometimes gets overlooked. It was really important things like weather conditions. Can you fly? What's the sea state? All of these things which at a different scale 
affect naval operations. You know, if there's going to be cloud cover, you are not going to be able to carry out effective aerial reconnaissance or engage the enemy. And all of those factors played a part in that battle. That's no, so do you mind if I add to John, John, uh, yeah. uh, if, if I may, um, and this has been one of my main articles in the, the uh, that tells the whole story, that uh, authenticated, I knew this story 70 years ago, but had no substantiation until I read in a book by James Duffy, a US historian, um, and there it was in black and white that uh, two Australian coast Australian coast watchers pinged the uh, Japanese fleet going down from Rebel to um, to capture Moresby. It brought about the Battle of the Coral Sea, and um, th there was a first repulse, major repulse of the Japanese from their sweep down from the northern hemisphere to the south, and they were beaten and uh, had to had to retreat. If they had taken Moresby, if they would, and they would have just walked in like they did Rabel, they were stupid. They should have done it three months earlier, when uh, instead of chasing poor old uh, coast watch, uh, poor old members down the island, they should have done that earlier, but uh, they didn't. The ramifications are unbelievable. Um, if they'd captured Rabel, uh, sorry, if they'd captured Moresby. Uh, and no doubt they were within bombing distance of Brisbane and uh, Rockhampton and all those places. It would have chopped off the contact or the uh, uh, view of the Americans using Australia as a base. They w there would have been no Kokoda, where uh, the Aussies, young kids, heroes, repulse the Japanese by, by land. And thirdly, Doug um, MacArthur, who uh, he would have been stuck down there in the southern hemisphere as it was now. He was released to, to go up into the north coast, do his island shopping, Sador, Rebel, sorry, Sador, uh, Idapi, uh, Wewak, uh, Moritai, Hollandia, uh, then up to Philippines and eventually to the end to win the Bombing War. So there were the ramifications which no one really knows. It's in my. Uh, uh, web website, um, if you just look at, think of TLC, Tender Loving Care, just the last Coast Watcher, that's the main story. I've got other stories, but that's the main story, in a nutshell, what the Coast Watchers really did. Jim, thank you very, very much. I think if I take anything from this, it's that we underestimate the Coast Watcher story at our peril. Um, it's, uh, that's yeah. my last mission at 96 next week. I'm going to make sure everyone in Australia knows to be proud of the Coast Watchers. Agile and courageous that they were. Thank oh, you. Don't about that. We just had a job to do and we did it. Well, at this point... It was a high adventure. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, we're going to leave the story of the Coast Watchers for the moment. In the next episode, we're going to discuss their strategically significant contribution to the war in the Pacific, which Jim has just foreshadowed for us. Um, in particular, we're going to have a look at the titanic struggle that the, was the Solomon's campaign. My thanks to Betty Lee, John Perryman, Peter Jones, and particularly Jim Burrows. Thank you for joining us. And for more great Australian naval history, just search for Naval Studies Group wherever you found this podcast. Goodbye for now. <laughs>